All right, folks, we're two minutes in, so let's get started. We are so happy to have you here today. On behalf of the Postal Work Career Development Center, I'm Laura Aiken, the Director of Graduate Career Development. And we're so thrilled to be able to offer you a special event here today on virtual professional presence being authentically you. A few Zoom housekeeping items. Please note that currently you all are muted, but you are welcome to add questions in the chat and raise your hands as appropriate if you have any questions. You are welcome to keep your cameras off at this point in time. It's completely optional. However, we will have a fun breakout session later on, and that will be the opportunity where you can connect with someone else, a peer of yours, and we do require that your camera is on at that point. This session is being recorded. However, the breakout rooms will not. With that, I'd like to move on and introduce you to our guest. If we can move the slide along. Lamia is here today. So Lamia is the Chief Talent Officer of Credos, our special guest today. And Credos is a boutique consulting firm based in California. Lamia's corporate background includes 15 years experience in operations and talent management, where she had the opportunity to build and lead teams across Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America for companies such as Bertelsmann, Orange, Intelencia, Groupon, Google and Microsoft. In her previous roles, Lamia specialized in leading cultural integrations after mergers and acquisitions, as well as launching and scaling new ventures from zero to 3,000 employees. Her work focuses on improving employee engagement and retention, workplace performance, morale, and inclusivity through a better understanding of cultural differences, diversity, bias, and behavioral dimensions. Lamia mentors startups at the Alchemist Accelerator, an ally powered by Arizon, uh, Verizon, and Plug and Play. She also serves as the board of directors of the Women's Club of Silicon Valley and is an advisor of Ostia, a global nonprofit organization built on the community of expert, experts whose goal is to ensure the success of women in high growth startups. Clearly a busy lady, we're very lucky to have her here today. Lamia speaks several languages, seven to be exact, and also finds herself translating human behavior, cultural nuances, and language at the same time. We're so happy she's able to join us today on our topic related to virtual professional presence as she speaks about how to be authentic to you. During the presentation, please be sure to put your presentation on speaker view to be sure you can see her face front and center to be sure you get a glimpse into all that she has to offer. We're thrilled um, to have Lamia and please take it away. Thank you so much for the very detailed and kind introduction, Laura. So hi everyone, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I've been talking to Laura for quite some time now and it's really um, a pleasure um, to be here. And again, thank you for taking the time. I know it's very difficult to get on another Zoom meeting, uh, but this one hopefully will be fun. So a quick overview of our um, agenda today. We will start with defining authenticity. We will be talking about values, um, but also about understanding your purpose the communication, and finally, the virtual presence. And the reason why we're talking about values, purpose, and communication, because the way you carry yourself has to do a lot with how actually your behavior is and in general. But without further ado, this is one of my favorite quotes ever, um, and a rule I live by, literally, um, and it's seek first to understand, than to be understood. The base of everything is understanding other people, how you situate yourself, but more importantly, also understanding yourself first. So, authenticity. So, authenticity is very important, but usually it's a very subjective um, thing um, simply because each one has 
each one of us has their own definition. So often we judge a person some authenticity by the passion, the commitment they have for what they say and what they do. And part of being authentic is standing up for yourself, what you believe in, and speaking the truth as it is. Now, the, thru the truth is very particular because it is as it seems to you and even if it's not necessarily what other people perceive. So the question, however, is authentic to what or to whom? People can be committed and passionate about lots of things. Um, just give it a little thought, people you know, your friends, colleagues, but this is by itself, usually it's not enough. Authenticity is more than when someone believe, uh, believes in what they say or acts in a very particular way that is consistent with their beliefs. And when we get to the belief part, all beliefs are valid no matter what, even if we don't necessarily agree with it, which is um, the fun part um, of just you know, interacting with people. Now, the more important part of authenticity, the authenticity question is to look at the character of the person. So first we have to give deep thought to what is it that we want to do? And this requires usually keen emotional intelligence, which is partially comprised of the ever powerful trait of self-awareness. So be mindful of your thought, be careful of how your action influenced other and act with intentions and motives that are aligned with your values. Now, our next slide, it's about the five qualities of authentic people. The first part I was mentioning, I was talking about um, self-awareness, self-reflecting. So to be authentic, unique, and the individual that you are, you have to know who and what you are, which comes through a lot of self-reflection, asking questions about what I'm trying to achieve, what's my purpose, what are my values, what are my beliefs. And uh, so in Arabic, we have a saying that says, you cannot know where you're going if you don't know where you come from. And coming from, it's not just a geographic location or a family or um, a country or um, a social um, background, it's literally everything that you carry on and that, um, that shaped who you are. So the self-reflection puts you um, in a state of personal harmony because you know what are the things that you would accept, things that you cannot accept. And from there, when we're talking about career is a very important thing, especially when you're interviewing because we will get to it later, uh, later interviews are a two-way street. Uh, the company is interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them. The second part oops, sorry, is listening. Uh, listening is the most valuable skill you can ever have and develop. And it's really, really important. Laura knows that. I always say you have to listen first, talk second. And um, you experience, when you listen, you experience experience fewer emotional threats uh, simply because you are on the listening end and you have this genuine desire to understand. So even when someone else is contradicting, uh, contra contra sorry, see my French is coming up, contradicting your views, you are more than willing to consider the ideas with an open mind, eventually change your opinion if it makes sense. And um, when you are a listener, you are a learner, which is extremely important, again, because when you are in interaction, you want to make the most out of it, be it an interview. This is why we're here today. Um, and um, you want to get hired or when you're talking with some friends, um, you want to be valued for the opinion that you're sharing. But all of that, um, starts with you listening so you can learn and adapt um, your conversation or your interaction so it's comfortable and respectful for everyone. This 
Third trait is, sorry, I'm trying to read here, having a clear vision. So having a clear vision, why? And that ties with the purpose. Again, we need to have a very deep and clear understanding of where we want to go. Um, what are our, our goals? What's our purpose? What are we trying to achieve? Because it will define all your behaviors and influence them in order to achieve that. Then we have transparency. Authentic people are very transparent. And I know that sometimes I've experienced that people think that being transparent is being blunt. Being transparent is actually telling things as they are and having open communication. Um, and the open communication is woven into the fabric of authenticity just because you are trying to learn again if we circle back and you share everything that you are thinking and you're just being you and finally it's the consistency authentic people are very consistent Consist consistent when it comes to their beliefs there is an alignment between their beliefs and values about what they say and about what they do. And it stays the same, um, no matter what the context or the situation is. And I know that m one of the questions that I'm often asked is, how can I be consistent when I need to adapt? I need to be flexible. You can be flexible and you can adapt without questioning or dismissing, which is the worst part, or um, that some people do, dismissing your values, because then this is when people experience burnout, or when we're talking about toxic cultures, this is exactly what happens. It's people who dismiss that part, that's part of who they are. Now I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions. So again, you will see there are a lot of quotes here because I do love my quotes. This one is very important because it points that it's being, authenticity is being true to the purpose and the values that drive us. Um, so just trying to read at the same time. That leads me to our next slide, which is the values. Um, Laura knows I, I talk about values all the time. So how are values formed? This is very important simply because there are three different phases of how our value system is developed as human beings. So we have, um, this is based on the Maurice Macy value system. So they are deeply ingrained um, principles and they influence everything from the decisions you're making, choice of your career, choice of your partner. Uh, your decision making process also is shaped by your values. And it's usually shaped by different internal and external influences, including family, traditions, the culture of the country you live in or you grew up in. So the imprint period is from birth to about age seven. And this is where the individuals begin establishing the template of what will become their own values. From there, we get to the modeling period, which is from age eight to roughly 13, 14. Um, and the individual's value template is then sculpted and shaped by parents, teachers, and other people. It can be, you know, the grandparents, um, school, peers, and um, coaches, or people who are athletes in the person life. And finally, we get to the socialization period, which is 13 to 21. And this is when you fine tune your values because you're going through personal exploration, uh, you're comparing, you're contrasting with other people's behavior and value system. So if I have, um, to summarize this, most of us are beyond the socialization, but we, what I discovered lately is we also have work values that 
are often aligned with our core values. And unfortunately, we tend not to think about it or double check that the companies that people are joining, um, there is an alignment there. And why values matter. So knowing your work values, again, or your values in general, it enables you to understand what drives and motivates you. Your motivational drivers often are um, deriving from your values. For example, if it's someone who values um, honesty or personal freedom, they will tend probably to be much happier in a job where they just can go and um, work on project. Maybe it's an individual contributor role where they would feel more comfortable because they're free from a lot of details and having to work with the team and so on. So there's a lot of things. But the most important part is they allow you to know what you want to avoid in the workplace. I don't think that anyone wants to work in a toxic work environment. So this is why understanding your values is extremely important. I'm just going to pause here for a second. And if we don't have any questions, we can go to the next, which is understanding purpose. So to put it simply, purpose is um, the reason why you're doing something. Um, and the goal is a measurable thing that you want to achieve. A lot of people will use the word interchangeably, like, oh, my purpose is to do that, but actually it's more of a goal. And a goal by definition is something we strive for and it should be aligned with our purpose. Um, goals usually emerge from your purpose. So if your purpose is, um, I don't know, to support people in their career, uh, then your goal, one of your goals can be, I'm going to choose um, a role that's in talent development. Uh, and you can be in sales and just discover that this is your purpose. And from there, you can define your goals. And that ties up to the, um, having a clear vision again uh, about authenticity because your goals will usually emerge from um, a vision and process or um, at the very least a plan. And um, that keeps us headed in the right direction. And again, you know, being authentic to what we believe in and in a way that serves our purpose. So um, goals are serving our purpose. Our purpose does not necessarily serve our goals. It helps us create them. Any questions? Don't be shy, um, everyone. Feel free to add anything in the chat or um, you can raise your hand. And if you're not sure how to do that, you can go to participants. And then in the bottom left of the um, participant view, there will be an opportunity to raise your hand. We'd love to hear from you or if you have any questions. I love this little doodle here that you see on your screen. Um, and by the way, sorry if you see me looking up, it's because I have two monitors and my slides are up, um, but my camera is right here. So just uh, a little bit of heads up as why I'm looking here. So um, there is what we call the intent and impact gap. And the reason why I love this picture is because you can see those people are in the same situation. One of them see four blocks. The other one sees three. Who's right, who's wrong? As an outsider, we see that they're both right. And we see that it's always about perspective. So individuals, they can be at the same place at the same time, and they will still leave with various conclusions about what really occurred. And now I want to ask you, just think about a time where you were interviewing with a company or you were talking to someone and you thought that it went great. 
And then you receive feedback that uh, finally didn't go that great. And you don't understand why. This is why it's very important to understand the perceptual inclinations the way um, that um, everyone um let me rephrase that everyone thinks that their perception is the reality and it is their reality the truth is that everybody sees the world through their own lens so what's totally acceptable for you or how you see things can be completely different your our culture our upbringing all of that shapes um uh, our perceptual uh, perceptual inclinations and they impact our relationship if we're not thoughtful about that fact. So again, most people usually intend to do or say the right thing, but things can be um, misconstrued and their actions or their words can reflect something other than their original intent. So this is why it's very important to step outside of the situation. Always envision this little doodle here and um, think about, I'm here, I'm having this interaction. Am I seeing things only from my perspective or would it be helpful if I see it from the other person perspective or just like step out completely out of the situation? And my recommendation is always the same, which is the only way to prevent this type of um, mishappenings is to ask questions or use what I call the three R's, which is a very well-known um, communication technique, which is repeat, review, and reinforce. So whatever you're saying, try to say it in different ways to make sure that your message went across. When we communicate, it's not just to say things, but we're trying to um, convey to the other person something. Review by asking questions, making sure that they understood. And this is very important, by the way, in interviews and more important when you are in a virtual mode because you cannot see the person and you're missing a lot of the cues that our brain is wired to recognize. So review, make sure that the person did understand. And again, because we're talking here about interviews or interactions with colleagues, reinforce by making sure that the points that are very important to you are coming across and most importantly being understood by the other person. Okay, communication. Now that I have everyone on camera and we still have some time so we can make things um, a little bit um, more fun. If I talk to you about uh, conversational styles, what do you think um, they can be? And you can actually answer maybe in the, in the chat or just unmute yourself. We have one professional or more personal as a conversation style. Okay, so personal, it is one of um, conversational style. So part of the communication is influenced by the culture. And I think it's a very important part to, um, to address. Um, there are seven conversational styles. So the first one is the direct. Europeans, American, they usually have a direct style which include explicit messages um, that express clearly the speaker's intention. This is like the Moroccan in me have sometimes a hard time with being in the US because I'm from a Mediterranean culture where everyone speaks at once and it's more personal but also um, indirect, which is the second um, conversational style. And this influences a lot your interactions, but also how you come across. And if you come from a culture where, uh, and we will get to it a little bit later, um, 
that uses indirect conversational style and you're interviewing uh, and you're trying to be direct, that wouldn't be you being authentic to yourself. So it's very important to identify which is your conversational style, why, and from there you can adapt and adjust. So then we have to elaborate. Um, people from Middle East, for example, Japan, they tend to be more elaborate. There is a lot of um, figurative language, a lot of metaphors and um, proverbs. And then we have also the Sikhsem, which is um, in some of the Asian countries, um, you have long pauses and understatements in conversation. Then you have the contextual, um, where the different status are taken into account to help decide the level of the formality that can be used in the conversation. So uh, I know I was a um, few years ago interviewing um, with a Korean company and um, I had to do my homework because depending on the people I was talking to, it was either extremely formal, and I say extremely formal in certain cases, I had to wait until the person talked to me first. Even though we were peers just because they were older than me. So it's very particular. Then we have the personal, which someone mentioned. So those are um, usually cultures that are less formal and they're more also focused on the individual and they disregard um, the differences. So it's a little bit the opposite of the contextual. And finally, you have the emotional conversational style, which is um, the messaging is often implicit with meanings found in more than nonverbal codes and cues than um, the actual words being used. Any questions regarding the conversational styles? Okay, perfect. So the reason why we're talking about this and about authenticity, it's because it defines your interaction with the person. And again, like I mentioned earlier, if you, your conversational style is, um, I don't know, um, elaborate and you're trying um, to be uh, more personal, emotional, it might come across as you not being comfortable. And this is again why, and I'm repeating, uh, understand what is your conversational style and make sure that you're aware of how it can be leveraged in your interactions in a way that allows you to be you, but also to be understood by the other person. From there, we're going to high and low context culture. So um, let's start with that. Hey, Lamia, we do have one, one question in here. Yes. Um, which one of the conversation styles is more effective or is it per culture that we should adjust? So the, you, the most effective one is the one that comes naturally to you. Uh, and the one that you feel comfortable. Now, it doesn't mean that if you are, um, again, have a direct style, uh, you cannot be emotional. You, you just need to adapt based on the, um, it's, it's a very tricky balance because you want to be authentic and be yourself because when you're comfortable, you know, you sound a lot more confident and you can deliver the message exactly the way that you need it to be delivered and convey things that you want to convey. But at the same time, you want the other person to understand you. And there is the context, which I call or the situation, which I call the third element. So it's a very tricky balance. And this is why you need to pay attention to the person you're interacting with and read the cues. Now in a virtual setting, you cannot, and your brain is already trying to um, make up for why I'm not seeing this person legs. Uh, and you have all these tags that are running in the back. Um, but people are usually are given cues. If you're talking too fast, they will tell you, um, can you please repeat? Or can you say it again? Or you can see that they're back in from the conversation and things like that. 
So when um, you pay attention to those little cues, and I understand that it's a lot more difficult um, in a virtual setting, uh, then your best tool is again to ask them, do you want me to clarify things? Um, how can I make things clearer? Or just ask them to make sure that the conversation goes well. Uh, but don't try to be, especially in interviews, that's the best advice I ever received and I'm passing on um, all, all the time. Just be you. I only say be you, be true to your beliefs. Uh, I have an accent. Um, sometimes I will use a French or Italian word in, instead of English. And I just give people heads up when I joke about it. I'm like, oh, you know what? My brain is wired in French today. So if I say it, sorry about that, just make me stop. Uh, if you don't understand me because I'm talking too fast, please make me stop. Because I know where the conversation can go wrong from an interaction perspective. And people, when you give them that permission to tell you, hey, you're speaking too fast, or um, I don't, I'm not sure I'm, I understand your, um, how do you call this in English? See, just talking about it. Um, this figure of speech, when you give that permission ahead, people will do it. But if you don't do it, nobody wants to make anyone feel uncomfortable. Um, especially if you're not from the country you're working in or interviewing in. Uh, so giving them that permission makes things a lot easier. But to do that, you need to know where things might go wrong or where people can face challenges understanding your conversational style. It's like behavior. If you're an introvert and you're hanging out with extroverts, you need an adjustment um, from both ends, but you need to communicate about that. Does that make sense? Yes, it is. Uh, I raised that question. I, it is clear. I mean, Laura, it is. Uh, sorry, Lami, it is clear now for me. Yes. Oh, thank you. Okay, so. Now, uh, so these concepts, um, they were first introduced by um, the anthropologist Edward T. Hall in 1976. And it's um, his book, I think it's called um, Beyond Culture. And um, those are two types of cultures. We didn't have enough time to go through like the different dimensions of the cultures uh, because there are seven of them. Uh, but I tried to summarize uh, the high context cultures and the low context cultures. The reason why it's important, because if you're coming from a high context culture and go into a low context culture, the way you will interact, and it has to do again with the conversational styles, is very different. So let me give you an example about how it can affect your um, interaction with people and why it's important to, again, understand this so you can make the most out of it. Um, for example, for a person from a low context, um, trying to, like we were talking about food. Let's get um, something about food then. Um, someone from a low context culture, they can tell their coworker, oh, I'm hungry and I cannot leave my work to buy food. I am someone from a high context um, culture. So my first reasoning would be, oh, my coworker, they would like me to go pick up food for them. But if they ask me directly, go grab food for me, I would find it rude. Where actually someone who's from a low context culture, if their coworker is telling them, oh, I'm hungry, but I cannot leave to work to buy food, for them, oh, they will be hungry until they finish their work. And this is also what creates a gap um, when you're communicating or when you are interviewing. Um, I've learned my lesson the hard way when I moved to the US, um, where it's a lot of 
verbal, a lot of intuition, a lot of feelings. Um, I'm from Morocco. Um, so it's, there is a strong distinction between the in um, group and out group, but it's the group who takes over the individual where in the US it's more on the low context um, type of cultures. And this is where you will see that you know, it's more about the fact the identity is biased, based in the individual, not in the group. And just to kind of help you situate things, this is what it would look like. So in high context, um, you will find countries like Japan, countries in the Middle East, Greece, Spain. So the Mediterranean countries are a little bit in the middle. Um, low context cultures, you will have Scandinavian countries, Germany, and US and Canada. Again, this is part of how you can be authentic. You need to understand we're talking about self-reflecting, knowing where you're coming from, to know where you wanna go, and what matters the most to you. Um, your purpose, people, for example, from high context cultures, their purpose tend to be more people oriented. Uh, and with a lot of empathy, um, there's even sometimes some altruistic component to it and so on, or in low context, it can be more um, individualistic, which is like the purpose is, um, I want to build you know, an empire or something like that. Uh, I'm just pushing the stereotype to make the image clear. And now let's talk about the virtual presence. So it's very difficult, like you've seen it today, because I have my two monitors and I'm trying to keep um, an eye here uh, as well. So the first thing is um, keep your eyes always at your camera level, not on the person, because then you're looking down and you're not looking straight to the camera. And this is very important when you are in interviews. In meetings, it's not that. Um, distracting if you're not looking, but when you're interviewing virtually, what you want is to actually for them to see you and to feel like you are looking at them as well. So it's very important. The second thing is maintain a strong voice. So when you use a loud voice, it will keep you from um, mumbling and from speaking too quickly um, because due to the amount of breath required to speak loudly, it forces you to speak at a pace that it's not too quick. Finally, have the right posture. So the proximity plays a big part in how the audiences um, or the person that you're talking to perceive you as the communicator. So if you're too far, you seem distant and then less engaging. Uh, if you are too close, because even if it's a screen, it might seem that you're invading their space. And also be very mindful of your background because I I've been in situations, Laura heard about the stories, um, or people were in their pajamas. Sometimes, you know, you have cluttered rooms, which makes me think that the person might be disorganized and it's also distracting me, so I'm not fully listening because I'm like, oh, there are those all these many things in the back. So distracting elements will um, pull attention away from you. You see, my background is always very simple. I have just my chair here, my second chair, something, and I'm restraining the, um, the space. I'm restricting the space that people can look at um, simply because they're, I know their brain is already wandering and thinking about other things. So just make it as easy as possible for them to just pay attention to what you're saying and what you're doing. So this is about the right thing. You can see my shoulders, uh, you can see my hand. So this is a very important thing, by the way. Um, it's as old as the word, but we tend to trust people when we can see their hands, but also it's very um, useful to make your points uh, when you're talking, uh, when you want to give more weight to, I don't know, um, a fact or um, 
an idea you can use your hands um don't leave them there our brain already is trying to make up why am i not seeing legs um uh, in this conversation and this is have the right posture and finally don't become your own distraction so when we are in a meeting first of all we don't see ourselves but when we're here in a video conference we do see ourselves so it made you realize oh maybe i have my child running behind maybe it's a pet so always make sure that you are um somewhere quiet things will happen so when it happens please don't feel bad about it it's very important everyone knows and um should understand uh just if you have i, I have three daughters uh so i always tell people ahead of time you know what if and i have a dog so if you see someone doing this or if you hear um it's because i'm working from home and i do have kids um and um i have a little trick it's i always hide um the view i don't want to be distracted um by watching myself so i just put literally um if i show you my other screen it's i have all the faces and the names as a band but i don't see myself so that way i can see people but not get distracted by whatever um um might see and i think that takes me to this which is i love oscar wilde i i wanted to leave you with this because mm -hmm. um I, it's just amazing. Everyone else is already taken. So just be yourself. Um, understanding who you are is the first step. Um, and what matters to you is the first step to being authentic. It's not necessarily an easy thing um, to stay authentic with everything that's going on right now. Uh, but yeah, just want to leave you with that. And we can open it for questions. Thank you so much, Lamia. That was excellent. And you definitely gave us great um, insight and recommendations for us to keep in mind. And I'm so curious to see what questions folks have, because I do know that uh, virtual professional presence shows up in various ways for us and, and in various formats. Um, so a quick question I'll ask, and then we'll wait to see if other folks come up in the, the queue here. Do you have any recommendations for students who might be using um, Higher View as a potential platform where everything's pre-recorded um, and any tidbits of um, feedback you could provide related to that unique situation versus it being a live virtual um, interview? So Higher View, I have mixed opinions on it, um, but the advice is um, do your research like really do your research about um, the company you will be interviewing. Usually um, you will have indications. I love Twitter for that uh, because you're still technically talking to people. It doesn't, not, it's because we, it's, oh my God, it's not because it's recorded that, and you're not talking to the person that you don't have to do your homework. You have the name of the person that will be doing that. So go do your homework, read what they write on Twitter. It's not stalking, I promise. You're just doing your homework uh, on LinkedIn, things that uh, matter to them. Um, and the reason why I have mixed uh, feelings about um, high review, it's because you cannot ask a question. And as I mentioned earlier, it's they are interviewing, the students are interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them. And in that process, that part is taken away. And um, yeah, my advice, just do your homework and um, know your strengths. So I, I have this trick where that one of my mentors shared, oh my God, 15 years ago uh, already. And every quarter, I write down what I accomplished. And it's handy, always. 
those are my strengths um, for interviews um, and just use it keep it handy and tell yourself this is exactly um, uh, what I'm bringing to the table uh, read it before you start the recording because it puts you in a good place and you feel more confident about what you can do as well sometimes we all need a little bit um, of you know confidence boost and we can do it all by ourselves Thank you. And there's another question here on any suggestions about how to gauge the authenticity of a potential employer. Okay, this one, I love it. It's very simple. You ask them what's their values and they will tell you, usually the values are, um, are stated in their um, website and they will tell you, um, oh, this, I don't know, like passion, innovation, and then like, how do you live by it every day? Or how does it translate in your processes and in your behaviors and in your teams? So if it's a real value, they will have uh, associated behaviors. And usually it's even in the hand um, book for employees. Those are the values and this is what they mean. And this is uh, how they translate into behaviors. If this is not aligned, you may be, don't want to go there. Um, do we have any other That's questions? Great. Thank you. No additional questions at, at this time. Well, thank you so much, Lamia. We'll be sticking around for a couple more minutes. So if anybody else wants to touch base with us, I'll be turning off the recording momentarily. Um, but we'll be here to answer any additional questions in the final few remaining minutes. But we appreciate your time and, and trust that you continue to stay well during this time. And we're just so happy to get to see your lovely faces in this virtual environment. Um, we look forward to when we can be in person, hopefully soon. And please stay well. And thank you again, Lamia, for your tremendous insight, perspective. You have such a fascinating background in your um, voice as a true ambassador of speaking seven languages. Understanding various cultures really means a lot. So thank you very much for your time. Wow, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're all set. Yeah, so feel free to sign off. Thank you for joining. And like I said, if there's anybody that wants to stick on and ask any questions, we'll be here. But otherwise, thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Nice to see you, Ty. Nice to see you again, Laura. Audra, Hi, Ty. Lamia, thank you. Uh,